so, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm Carla. I'm based at the Randall Center in uh, King's College in London. Um, so by background, I'm a stem cell biologist, biochemist. Uh, so you're not going to see many formulas as part of this presentation. Mostly my um, uh, what I'm going to present is basically what I think are my approaches in order to basically get closer to modeling sustate transitions. So really working on the biology, the biochemistry in order to develop, uh, start informing and parametrizing the mathematical models. So just to give you a bit of an introduction, um, my work mostly focuses around looking at the dynamics of sustate transitions. So what I'm gonna to present today is uh, this. So how do you uh, basically use functional-based approaches and top-down approaches uh, to look at sustate transitions? But a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is also about identifying signatures of this transition in single cell RNA sequencing by removing kind of uh, both technical and uh, temporal heterogeneities but also uh, modeling uh, developmental disorders uh, and looking at the role of signaling pathway dynamics uh, in these disorders. So uh, just to start again from the very basics, I'm interested, as I said, in cell state transition. So how does a cell rewire its identity, basically? So these transitions do not uh, result or do not require any change to the DNA content, but just to the properties of the cells. So what we know is that these transitions are absolutely fundamental for embryonic development. Uh, as cells progressively specialize over time. So here showing a diagram of what's happening in mouse, um, but also in the adult, for example, during homeostasis, as stem cells uh, divide in order to um, just replace cells lost during normal kind of wear and tear, uh, during wound healing. Um, uh, and we know that when these transitions go wrong, we can get diseases such as developmental disorders, cancers, um, and during ages as well, we think that these transitions tend to become, uh, to degenerate. So I'm particularly interested in using uh, developmental systems. And if we think about the sort of approaches that are typically used to study uh, these transitions, um, some of them might be considered basically bottom-up approaches in which we start, for example, by characterizing all the components of a cell over and how they change over a given window of time. Uh, and from that, we try to first cell states. And some of these approaches have worked, uh, they're great for trajectories. So if you want to understand, for example, the path that cell might follow, um, we can get that information using these sort of approaches and they're great for exploring new systems for which, for example, we know very little about the underlying biology. Um, but I think they come with a number of limitations. Um, so the first one is, for example, using this sort of approaches is very difficult to determine when the transition occurs. So for example, let's take a progenitor cell um, how do we know when that progenitor is no longer a progenitor and it has basically irreversibly differentiated? The second challenge is that we often limit it to one or at most two regulatory levels. So for example, um, are only the genes important for regulating this process or what's happening, for example, to the protein or to the post-translational modifications? Um, of course, an important one uh, that I think as most people doing modeling can appreciate is also this idea of the curse of dimensionality of trying to figure out what are the important parameters. So in order to understand a cell state transition, do I need to understand what's happening to every single one of the genes um, that is associated with this process and it's changing? Um, and finally, um, what are the ideal dynamics? So how a cell transition from one state to the other might be a chain-like reaction, or it might be an abrupt step-like process, uh, but this might not necessarily be reflected, for example, in how the mRNA changes level over this same period. So I think what I'm really proposing to do as part of my work is to take basically a top-down approach, uh, in which we start by looking at cell states before trying to identify how they're regulated. Now, the motivation for this approach uh, is that cell states, so what makes, for example, a progenitor, a progenitor cell uh, different from a differentiated cell are really, um, is part of the regu is regulated at multiple levels. So they're effectively emergent properties. Um, and the second, I think, motivation for taking this approach is that currently we cannot measure everything. We are very, we're somewhat limited as to the sort of uh, techniques that we have that allows us to characterize the various components of cells. But I think this approach has very, some key advantages. And the main ones being that we're not limited to looking at a single regulatory level. So we can look at, for example, whether a transition might be 
important to be regulated, for example, by key post translational modifications or by a particular enhancer switching on. Um, the other limitation, the other advantage is that uh, we can narrow down the, the factors that are important. So the key parameters that control the transitions as does that change. And then we can perform actually functional screens. So we can ask, well, is that particular regulator important for this? Yes or no. Uh, and how is important? Does it still care about the levels? Or maybe does it need to, is about cumulative levels uh, being important for that transition from A to B to happen? So again, in a very, um, Kind of simplified way, I would think about you know bottom-up approaches as being almost like Newtonian-like because you, if you want to understand what's happening and to build a model as to how that might be controlling a cell state, you need to understand how the individual components are working, uh, and this again creates a huge number of parameters. What we're really aiming to do is something I guess that might be more closer to statistical mechanics in order to identify basically what are the key um, parameters, how do they change and to narrow, uh, to basically narrow this down. So if we want to build models, uh, what do we actually need? Uh, what are the key challenges? Where are we? And basically what we're aiming to get at. So the first uh, actual challenge is how do we define cell states? So how do we know again, where are the progenitors? Where are the differentiation states? Is there other states in between here? And um, currently there's many definitions depending on what sort of field you work. Um, what we want to move towards uh, in the lab is towards this functional based definition. And again, I'm gonna come back uh, to what we mean by this in a second. The second challenge again is the dynamics. So currently we tend to have very sparse data. For example, we know that at time zero, we might have a progenitor cell and we know that at 48 hours, we have a differentiated cell but we have no idea about the dynamics of this process. So does the cell gradually change properties over time or is there an abrupt boundary between the states? So we, went, we want to aim to go to basically a model in which we can see the dynamics of how this transition happens. And finally, we want to understand what are the control parameters. So um, again, we've seen that biology presents kind of a unique complex um, system in which we have signals that control transition. So we know, you know, plus a signal, the cell transitions from A to B, but a signal is dynamic. Somehow this target, in this case, for example, a protein interprets this dynamics uh, and translates this dynamics. And again, the cell state and the cell state dynamics somehow interpret this target dynamics, right? So we have multiple regulatory levels, quite complex behavior. The question is, do we need to understand, do we need to have a model that, um, accounts for each single one of these dynamics, or can we simplify the system? Um, so just to kind of go back a second to introduce you the main system, uh, experimental system. So I work mostly with mouse embryonic stem cells. So you can capture, so mouse embryonic stem cells, you can capture them from the early pre-implantation uh, mouse embryo. So just before the embryo plants, there's a group of cells there. Do cells have the potential, are the cells that give rise to basically the adult mouse? Um, and we can put the cells in culture, we can capture them in culture and keep them in this state forever. Uh, so self-renewing, meaning that the cells divide without changing properties. Uh, we can put the cells back into the embryo and they give rise to chimeras, but importantly, we can differentiate the cells further. So we can give the cells specific signals and allow them to start undergoing these fate choices uh, down the line to form different cell types. Like for example, here we have the precursors of, um, of muscles, blood, and the gut, we can form the brain, and we can form also the precursor for sperm and eggs. So um, how do we define cell states? Again, um, we said we want to take a functional based approach. Okay, so what is the function of a cell? How do we quantify it? Um, I would argue that for most biological process, at least I'm interested in developing homeostasis, um, the function of a cell or what defines the function of a cell is what that cell can or cannot do. Um, and if we try to break this down, uh, eventually this can be almost condensated to the ability of cells to respond to signals in a specific way. So what makes a stem cell uh, different from a differentiated cell is the fact that a stem cell, you give them the right signals and it behaves in a particular way which is completely different. As soon as the cell differentiates, it becomes sternly differentiated, it no longer responds to the signals in the same way. To give you an example. So again, we're looking, this is my favorite transition. Uh, 
we have mouse embryonic stem cells. Naive and formative are just the names that were given the, these two different cell states that we've characterized um, quite well. So basically you take mouse embryonic stem cells uh, in this naive state, you just wait for 24 hours. And this is the very, very early step before the cells start deciding what to become basically. So just this happens in, in addition 24 hours. And we ask, how do the cells respond to signals? In this case, the signals I'm asking them to respond are cultural conditions uh, for embryonic stem cells. So again, unsurprising, you take embryonic stem cells, you put them in the culture conditions where they normally thrive and survive, you get colonies. So each of these, you might see these black dots represent a colony of a few hundred cells. So single cell can make a colony. If we do the same experiment with the cells here, these formative cells after 24 hours, they've lost the ability to form colonies and we can quantify this over time. So just over a short period of window, 24 hours, the cells have changed how they respond to signals. Uh, to give you another example, again, same transition, we can ask how do the cells respond to a site? So wind signaling. So wind signaling is a signaling molecule important for patterning. If we give the signal to mouse embryonic stem cells, they are regulate one particular transcription factor. So this is just immunostaining in um, what you can see here, the circle dots are individual nuclei. So embryonic stem cells are regulated one transcription factor, just 24 hours later, the cells have completely rewired their identity so that they respond very differently or completely differently to the same signal. So same signal, completely two, two completely different responses. So what we're aiming to do is to um, use these changes in the signaling pathway in order to uh, map cell states and identify boundaries between cell states. So we think we can use this approach in order to systematically map, let's say, along a neural differentiation trajectory to systematically look at what point the cells change how they respond to the signals in order to identify basically what are the cell states, where are they? At what point does the cell change how they respond to the signals? Now, the second point that we're interested in is identifying the dynamics of transition. So are they continuous or are they discrete? And again, I think we can determine this by looking uh, at doing the same functional assays as before, but just looking more closely as to how, that, uh, how the cells are changing properties over time. So to give you an idea, again, same experimental system, we have embryonic stem cells, we differentiate them and we ask, um, can cells for colonies in ES cell culture conditions? And now we're sampling cells rather than every 24 hours, every four hours. So if we had a continuous process when the cells gradually change properties over time, what we might expect is that if we plot, uh, so x-axis is hours of differentiation versus in this case, um, what percentage of cells can self-renew and form colonies, we might expect this to remain constant, but that the colony area would reduce over time, meaning that as the cells transition from A to B, they progressively lose this ability to form colonies. Now, if we actually do these experiments, this is not what we see. What we see instead is that the number of cells that can self-renew decreases over time, but that the colony area always stays the same. In other words, even if you take, let's say, a 40 hours here, only 20% of the cells come from colonies, but the size of those colonies is exactly the same as the cells have only been uh, in culture for six hours. So what this is telling us is that we have basically a discrete transition. So this naive to formative A to B um, transition is discrete because either the cells make a colony or they don't. But the other thing that we're learning about this is that this process is non-synchronized. Again, we take this 30 hour time point, for example, and roughly 50% of the cells come from colonies, 50% of the cells cannot. So by simply testing how cells respond to signals over time, doing this kind of quite accurate measurements, we can determine not only where the state, the cell states, uh, what the cell states are, but also what sort of the dynamics of transition. Uh, again, whether it's discrete or gradual. So we've defined the cell states, we've defined the dynamics. Um, I've shown you data for some of the kind of this stereotypical transition, uh, which I'm kind of representing here as a diagram is an A to B transition. The cells have no other choices. Doesn't matter what signal I give to the cells, they don't care, they can only go either naive or formative. What I'm doing at the moment, or the, the objective of the lab is to really expand this to other types of transitions. And in particular, we're interested in uh, kind of fate bifurcations. 
So mouse castration is a great system because you have different types of bifurcation happening, uh, or at least transitions that have been reported to be fade bifurcations. So there's very this limited experimental evidence that this is truly the case or not. So we really want to take our approach to understand whether what's happening here, whether they show the same type of dynamics, um, in particular transitions that respond to basically plus or minus signals. Uh, and also we have transitions which respond to graded levels of signals, uh, as well as niche effects. So, which brings us to, so again, as part of this, we have defined the cell state, we have defined the dynamics, which leads us to probably the, one of the biggest questions, which is how do we identify really the control parameters? So again, I'm gonna give you an example. We're still looking at the same um, transition, i.e. to formative. And we know that the signaling pathway is really important. So FGF4 is one of the key, is, um, is a signaling molecule. Um, the cells produce them themselves, actually, the embryonic stem cells. It binds a receptor in the plasma membrane and that activates a signaling pathway cascade, um, activating the ERK pathway. And we know there's various negative feedback loops. So here, for example, I'm showing RSK, which feed, feeds back at the receptor level in order to um, dampen signaling. So to give an example of sort of experiments we have, we take embryonic stem cells. This is twice simply the, the name of the culture condition in which we keep them. So we can take embryonic stem cells and then culture them for let's say 30 hours, in our basal media. So we start this differentiation process. Again, we're in initiating this transition from naive to formative. If you remember from the previous data, we show that the differentiation was non-synchronized. So we take, again, this is the same uh, data as before. We ask how um, at these 30 hours, uh, how many cells come from colonies? And roughly we have 50% of the cells come from colonies, right, in these control conditions. Um, just to show you a parallel essay, we can also measure, we can also use reporters. So in this case, this REX1 reporter, this is flow cytometry data. So this is intensity um, against effectively density. Um, REX1 is expressed in the, cell, in the undifferentiated cells. So as long as the cells have REX1, they can form colonies in ESL culture conditions, they are undifferentiated, they then regulate REX1. So go below this kind of red line threshold. Um, and they've become formative. So they've undergone this kind of switch-like uh, behavior. So what happens if we mess around with the pathway? If we inhibit the pathway, cells retain um, the ability to form colonies and expression of Rex1. Effectively, they become stuck in this state, in this undifferentiated state. But we can also overactivate the pathway. So we block this negative feedback loop um, you increase basically the flow through the pathway, you get much higher levels of ERK activity, and now you accelerate differentiation. So at this exactly the same time point, when you treat cells with RSK, you have a lower number of colonies. So more cells have gone to the formative state. And again, more cells have then regulated REX1. So you sped up this whole transition. So um, the levels of ERK signaling, we know they are important regulators of this. Again, the question is, is this enough to define a control parameter or not? The only thing that we know basically as part of this is that Merkrick signaling is somehow having an effect and helping drive this transition, but we know nothing else, basically. Um, so in order to try to break this down, again, we're going more into the biochemistry, but just to give you kind of a flavor of the sort of things we can do, we can think about the way the signal might drive this transition as either by repressing the initial state uh, so it might repress, for example, an important transcription factor that drives uh, the gene expression network of the naive embryonic stem cells, or alternatively, it's possible the cells transition from one state to the other by being actively almost pulled out of the naive state, right? So by the expression of some sort of new factor that drives them out of the state towards formative. Um, so to show you, again, I'm gonna only really talk about this initial part, um, Oh, sorry. And it's also possible to have crosstalk, of course, between these two events. So how do we identify, how do we answer the first question? So is there anything downstream? Uh, does the activity, this pathway, uh, mecker pathway, somehow negatively regulate the initial naive state? Well, the hypothesis is that if it's negatively regulating a uh, transcription factor when the pathway is active, this transcription factor goes down, the cells differentiate, they go out of the naive state. When the cells are treated with inhibitor, this pathway is not active. This transcription factor presumably remains active and the cells 
on differentiate. So we can ask again, this is the same data as before, same experiments. When the, MEC, when the cells are inhibited, treated with MEC, cells express Rex1. What we can do is ask, well, can I get, what transcription factors can I get rid of so that my cells can start differentiating even when the signaling pathway is not active? So we can do screens for this in order to identify, again, a lot of factors. So this is, these are two well-known transcription factors, both of which were reported to be downstream or targets, at least biochemical targets of the pathway. But one has absolutely no effect, which is KLF4, whereas knockdown of nanog allows for the cells to exit, to start the transition, even when the signal is absent. So again, very simplistically, what is showing, we can start generating this kind of interacting diagrams about you know, the relationship between these. Now, I'm, some, I'm really keeping the story very, very simple. Um, to give you an idea you know, why we think about this as emergent properties and so on, you know, something about the dynamics of ERK is actually regulating nano translation efficiency and is in part the amount of available nanog mRNA that can be converted to protein that really dictates the threshold between these two different states. But again, the question is, how do we really go to determining, we still not build a parameter out of this. We have, sorry, we have this transition. What do we know so far? Well, we know there is an abrupt boundary and we know there is this sort of relationship do we need to know everything? So is this, a, do we need to build basically a whole series of nested um, ordinary differential equations in order to really understand how this process is regulated? Or what is the true control parameter? Does the cell care about integrated levels of ERK or nanog mRNA levels? So the approach that we're taking in order to really try to break this process down is first we observe. So we look at the relationship, how this uh, parameters change over time and we're doing a lot of live imaging. So this is, for example, uh, this is what the reporter for ERK signal looks like. So this is a nuclear reporter. So you can see it goes up and down, oscillates in response to some of these feedback loops. And we can measure the effect that it has on nanoprotein. So this is the fundamental building block effectively to uh, build hypothesis. So based on this, we build a hypothesis about, for example, the cells really care about ERK reaching a specific threshold, nothing else. Then we come to test it. In order to test it, what we're doing is using optogenetics. So we can uh, using shine light on the cells and specifically activate the pathway when we want it for at the given intensity, but also for a given period of time. So we can ask, does the cell care about the integrated intensity? We generate different patterns with equal integrated intensity. We see whether the cells transition with the same dynamics or not. So again, it's about reconstructing the patterns to really try to test this hypothesis about, you know, what is the true, uh, in order to get to the actual control parameters. So again, just summarizing very briefly, we have cell state transition. How do we start building models? Well, by defining cell state and looking at the dynamics, we can start building a landscape. By going into kind of the hardcore biochemistry, looking at the dynamics, we want to really identify what the control parameters is to try to get this to the least number of possible, um, you know, free parameters really. That is overall the objective. Uh, and we suspect that these are gonna be complex parameters. So rather than being something that you can measure directly, it might be something like, again, integrated ERK levels, for example. And something which I haven't really talked about, but is fundamental to this is the idea of multicellular coordination. So what I've shown you today is what's happening to a single cell. But we've known that the cells interact with each other, uh, their cell cycle, neighboring effects, and of course, a lot of asynchrony. Some cells, as you see, differentiate faster than others. So we want to try to integrate as a kind of secondary step all of these things um, into these kind of models. Um, so yeah, with this, I'll just finish here uh, by thanking everyone who's helped me. So I did my postdoctoral work um, and some of this work in the lab of Kevin Chalou, uh, who continues to be a great collaborator. I, I'm currently a King's Prize Fellow um, at King's and trying to look for further funding. And yeah, all of these people have helped at various stages of this project. And if you'd like to get in touch, uh, these are my contact details. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Carla, for a wonderful talk. <clears throat> so I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves and, and, and you know, ask.
And okay, so while we are waiting for folks to think about questions, I will start by asking a question. And Carla, you alluded to this at the end of your talk, right? Like you might have noise and heterogeneities, et cetera, in your system. And how easy to, you know, then just like decipher what is your actual signal or, or you know, in, with, with all of this other stuff that's going on? I think, I think that's why, you know, we're getting, so a couple of things. So first of all, using the live imaging really helps mm -hmm. us determine whether, um, you know, if all of the transitions are happening consistently, uh, but there is quite a level of play, we know that that is a level of noise that the cells tolerate. Mm -hmm. But again, integrating that together with the, micro, with the optogenetics allows us to create very specific patterns. So there's a lot more control. We can reduce some of that heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of aspects, so we're currently working, again, this is more like, you know, by how the biology starts to instruct some of the mathematical models. Right. The objective really, we're working with also people who are doing just purely modeling in order to understand, well, you know, how does the, for example, the, what's the effect of the noise on a particular transition, you know, mm -hmm. purely theoretical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and can we, is there any signature that we can look back in our data, mm -hmm. in order to see, if, you know, to try to understand whether, you know, we might be able to identify it almost retrospectively. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any so, other questions? Uh, so, Carla, you mentioned the uh, cell cycle, right? Cell cycle mm -hmm. parameter. How do you determine cell cycle stage in your experiment? Um, the in the initial ones is a bit more tricky. So, in, when we define cell states and so on, so the cell cycle normally comes in at the level of when we're trying to basically uh, infer the control parameters. Uh, so most, because I, again, the key initially, we just try to identify, okay, these molecules are important. The secondary stage is very much based on live imaging or how these parameters change over time. Mm -hmm. um, so this becomes basically an intrinsic measure out of the light of the movies. So most of these transitions do span at least one or two cell cycle divisions. I see. Oh, I see. And also, we know that they're regulated, right? So a lot of, well, again, I'm not, I had to simplify a lot of the data, but we know that, for example, the Earth signaling pathway also controls the cell cycle, which in part we think feedbacks onto the mechanism for control for nano. Yeah, I also had a related question, you know, about how all of this is related to the CDK cycling or other things, you know, other kinds of. They are, yeah, they are. They are controlled because. So for example, nanoprotein itself, how much you have of it uh, is a, so nano is a direct target of all the CDKs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very short lived protein, but it does require the activity. And we know that ERK controls how long the CDKs are active and for what stage. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, but again, so all of these things exist at different levels. The question is, do we need to know, understand all of these or uh, yeah. ultimately for the transition does the cell, for example, only care about nano mRNA availability? Right. No, absolutely. So uh, I, I think I'll take one to... question from Anand Singh, who yeah. has his hand raised for some time. Anand, why don't you unmute yourself and ask? Hi, thank you for mm -hmm. a great talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether you could kind of comment on the, like, um, introduce noise at the input level, how that propagates into the network and affects the sulfate decision. And are there experimental ways of tab understanding these you know, uh, parameters? I, th I think that's an, that's an excellent question. And it's something that we are trying to play with, um, particularly as part of one of the second project that I mentioned we're working. So they are, so there's some- For example, like wind, whether you give a, you know, a constant dose or you could do, you know, using some of these tools to pulsate at certain, you know, 20 minute, half an hour, one hour, the problem is it's a vast parameter space. It is. So, so I think how why, somebody yeah. goes and tests all these, yeah. So I think is there like yeah. modeling help, can help? Of course, to... yeah. And I think that's the idea. Once we have, you know, that's truly the, the appeal as well of doing some of the modeling is that once we get close enough, we can say, okay, so let's start scanning. So we, we're hoping not to have that many free parameters as part of our modeling. Uh -huh. But the other aspect I mentioned, so optogenetics is brilliant for this because you can do these experiments in 96 well plates. So yep, you yep. are able to experimentally test this um, to, you know, just 
do it almost like as a screen. Let's screen all the different type of uh, combinations of signals. But what you were asking before about the level of input of signals, um, cell cycle will of course provide a natural variation within your population, whether you want it or not. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a lot of intrinsic parameters. We're trying to play with them, for example, about how efficient transcription is. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, we're, we're definitely trying to play with that and see what happens. But still Thank very you. much preliminary. Thank you.